So who here um, works in infrastructure or SRE or DevOps? Can you raise your hand? Okay, great. Uh, and who here gets interrupted a lot? Okay, yes, a lot of the same people. And I am, I am among my people, so that's good. So if you are part of sort of like the uh, online productivity hellscape discourse, you've probably seen this. Uh, this is the Eisenhower matrix. Uh, the idea is that something can be either urgent or not urgent or important or not important. And you want to do all the stuff on the top left that's like urgent and important. And all that stuff on like the bottom right that's not important and not urgent. You want to get that out of your life and you'll be as productive as American President Dwight Eisenhower. Um, in my experience, uh, what happens is that uh, you get a Slack message about something is maybe broken uh, and all this goes completely out the window and your, your dreams are shattered. Um, so to this end, um, I spend a lot of time thinking about how to avoid getting interrupted myself and how to, how to keep the teams that I'm on a little bit more focused. And uh, for that reason, this is what my... My bookshelf looks like, uh, I'm sorry to report uh, that this is the art of agile development on the far right. There's a lot of red flags here. Um, you've, you've worked with people like me. I, I like the Phoenix Project. I consider it to be a real page turner about DevOps work uh, and how to organize it. Um, you know, you've been on teams with people like me where you're arguing about like a database schema in a meeting and then I'm sort of quiet at the back of the room and I'm raise my hand and I'm like, I think actually maybe this is more of a people problem than a technical problem. You know, that's unfortunately uh, who I am. Um, and so I have this inordinate love of process um, and it has gotten me into a bit of trouble, uh, led me down some bad paths in my experience. Um, I have made my team do stand-ups by the freight elevator because there was nowhere else in the office to do them. Um, I've done something called value stream mapping, or it's like, let's take this, let's show how this idea becomes like a reality through all the different pipes, imagining software to be um, something similar to like the actual physical supply chain, which uh, it's not. Anyway, um, who am I? Uh, I am a uh, prod engineer at Shopify. I work on observability. Um, I'm on the internet, plant fan Sam, no special expertise in plants, just think they're cool. Um, I've been doing software stuff for about 10 years. I've worked at startups, I've worked at nonprofits, consultancies, mid-sized companies, and now Shopify is pretty big. I also started my own consultancy, which if you're keeping score at home, that just means I freelanced and I just sort of had like a company name that wasn't my name. Um, and over this time, I've bounced in between infrastructure and coding. And I think that's kind of why I'm confused about how the plan worked properly. So um, here's the only thing I know about how to plan work. Um, let's see. Work planning must meet team and organizational needs. Um, this is so simple as to verge on tautology. However, um, I personally, as you've seen from my bookshelf, I can lose sight of the point of the work planning process. And um, I can get so deep into Scrum and Agile that I can forget why we're even doing it. And process, of course, for the sake of process, is completely pointless unless you are an agile consultancy. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, that, is, that is not where I work. So uh, one important thing here is that you cannot generalize from one organization to another uh, because team and organizational needs differ. And I think this is best demonstrated through another very, very uh, revolutionary counterfactual which is that bad work planning doesn't meet team and organizational needs. And bad work planning can actually be quite dangerous in my experience. Uh, it can slow your team down and it can also cause morale problems. So I'm going to tell a story about how I came to this conclusion. And I take some poetic license here. I've worked at a lot of different places. Um, so it's kind of a mishmash of different experiences. Um, but it's ultimately a story about not generalizing your experience unnecessarily or uh, without the appropriate safeguards in place. So without further ado, let's get to part one um, in which I come to believe that Scrum is good. So uh, early in my career, and this is um, not me early in my career, but this is someone in their career. This is uh, 1959. Uh, this UNIVAC computer is going to allegedly uh, predict a winning horse. And uh, so imagine me early in my career, something like this guy. And I was working at a organization and I was 
working on a project with three other uh, tech folks. And I was put in charge of this project about um, right before we shut down for Christmas break. So I was put in charge of this project right before Christmas break. And I was way too early in my career to be doing this. Um, and uh, it was this user facing product team and I had no idea how we were gonna organize the work. So what did I do? Like a good nerd, I went to the library. This is the Omaha Library, uh, the reading room in 1939. Looks very peaceful, although they are, I think they are doom scrolling the um, newspapers. Uh, <laughs> that's, my, that's my understanding of the situation. Um, so I, at the library, I read this book. It was called Learning Agile, and I learned all about Scrum. And I was like, oh my God, Scrum, this is the truth. This is the only way that anyone should ever plan any kind of software project. And I actually went back and looked at this book and there are sections on uh, Kanban and extreme programming. So it's sort of funny to imagine what would happen to this talk if I had actually finished the book, but much like the rest of the books on my bookshelf, I did not. Um, so the rest of the talk will not make sense unless I explain what I, what I remember learning from this book. Like, What is Scrum uh, in my head? Because it's sort of like, um, DevOps has no meaning. Um, Agile and Scrum basically have no meaning at this point because everyone thinks they mean something different. So uh, very quickly, hopefully quickly, I uh, hope I don't lose the audience. I want to explain what I think Scrum is. Uh, work in Scrum is oriented around individual user stories. And these individual user stories should deliver business value. So for example, as a seller, I want to print a shipping label so that I can mail an item. And that, that so that I can mail an item is the business value in the user story. And the team uh, that is doing Scrum will commonly commit to a scope of work for a fixed period of time. Uh, that's often known as a sprint. And uh, that work in the sprint is negotiated by a product owner. The product owner basically says like, you know, this is what we're gonna do for these two weeks. And um, once you begin the sprint, it cannot be changed. Uh, that is a very important facet of this. So you don't get knocked off of your Eisenhower matrix. You're like, no, we're doing the top left corner, right? Um, and I would say another important facet is that the team is committing to the scope of work. It is not individuals on the team that are saying, I'm gonna do X, Y, and Z. It's your entire team is saying, we're gonna do all this stuff. And ideally this means that anyone on the team can pick up any piece of work. Um, you will uh, uh, see it follows naturally from that uh, premise. Um, and then also you cannot talk about Scrum without talking about a prescribed set of meetings. And, and hopefully if you're doing Scrum, you have these meetings and no others. So let's talk about those meetings. Um, backlog grooming, the user stories that comprise like what is work in a, a team that's doing Scrum. Uh, it is, uh, lost my train of thought there. So you've got user stories, right? And you have to get them from somewhere. And backlog grooming is where you turn these ideas of user stories into something that your team can do. Uh, you sort through all possible work that, that your team might do and you order it by priority and you make sure that it's expressed in these user stories that people can do. And you have to make sure that they're pretty small because you want people to be able to pick up the user stories uh, and complete them within the confines of a sprint, which is, you know, let's call it two weeks. And ideally you want them to be able to complete the stories in one to three days. Um, so in order to plan how much work you can do in a sprint, if, in order to see if the stories are the right size, you, you need to know how hard each of these stories is. And the place that you do that is in estimation. So in estimation, which is also known as planning poker, you decide how much effort the team thinks a story can, will take. So you assign a numerical value to each story um, collaboratively. The higher the value, the more difficult the story is. And the way that this works in my experience is your entire team gets in a room and you say, on the count of three, we're gonna evaluate the story you know, about adding a, a payment method for a customer. And on the count of three, everyone shouts out a number and uh, you know, someone says 13, someone says one, and then you uh, sort of hash out why those differ and eventually, oh, let's, we'll settle on five. And if you wanna argue about like the scale of user stories, I'm happy to talk about that after the talk. Um, and the reason why we do this process, why do we estimate stories is so that when we're planning a sprint, we don't over or under commit. So at this point, uh, you've got this big stack of user stories and uh, they have uh, point values attached to them and uh, you can do sprint planning. So here's like a sprint calendar here and um, Monday is the top left corner and it's assuming a two week sprint. And on Monday morning, you all get to the office and you decide what are we gonna to commit to for the next two weeks and your product owner has a very heavy hand in this process because they know what's really important. 
and you commit to this set of user stories as a blah, 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 I can blah, 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 so I can blah, blah, blah. Or I, I think I have written here as a foo, I want to bar so that I can baz. Um, so that's another way of putting that. Uh, so let's skip over grooming and estimation. And then on Friday, you have your sprint review and your retrospective. And in your sprint review, you demo your work. Um, and you often do this to your product owner or also uh, maybe if there's a stakeholder that your product owner was talking to, they'll be in the room. So if you're working on call center software and they requested a new page in their call center software uh, that you know displays additional information about the person that's calling, you know, maybe the rep that had that idea will be in the meeting and they'll say, oh yeah, like this is great. Or like, oh no, this actually won't show up on my screen because X, Y, and Z. Uh, the other meeting that you'll have on Friday is the retro, which is in my experience, the most important meeting in software development. Um, there's a lot of great formats for it and you don't have to do Scrum to have a retro. So, you know, you should have retro. Uh, but in retro, you talk about what went well, what went poorly, what do you want to do differently in the next sprint. So altogether, here's what Scrum looks like in my brain. Um, you've got your sprint planning on Monday, you work hard for a week, uh, then you work hard on Monday. Tuesday, you're kind of like, ah, I guess like we're gonna do some backlog grooming. Wednesday, you do story estimation. That's like maybe an hour or two um, at some point in the day. Thursday, you're like trying to finish everything. And then Friday, you have your sprint review and your retro. And ideally, you have very few meetings besides what you have on the calendar. So I'm, remember, at the library, uh, I'm muddling through all this. I'm like, this is, this is incredible. I think this is exactly how we should be doing everything all the time. And I convinced my team after the holiday break uh, that we should do it. And they are like, you know, sure. I don't know. Why not? It seems like something that people do. Let's give it a shot. So uh, the meetings were extremely challenging. If you've ever introduced Scrum to a team, you know how hard that process can be. Um, you have to go through your whole backlog and sort it and uh, figure out what you want to be doing. But I think ultimately it went well, um, not like for me personally, but for the team. Um, it really, the thing that, that I think made a big difference is that uh, it successfully directed our work. Uh, we felt like we were making progress because we had to do this incremental delivery. And um, what we also found is a little bit of organizational clarity. We found that we did not have a product direction at all. Um, and we went around the organization. We were like, what are we supposed to be doing? And people were like, that's your job. You figure out what you're doing. And um, that was a valuable insight to have um, at the time. And this experience convinced me that Scrum is good. Um, that it can be really hard, but that it's worth it. So let's fast forward quite a few years. Um, I go deeper into infrastructure. I'm a little bit further from product-facing development. I've been on a few ops teams, and um, we'll talk about that term uh, later. Um, but I started this job working on an ops team. If you've been on the team that's like, hey, this is the team that knows the most about GKE or AWS or Azure, and you know you haven't really productized everything that you do, so you're getting a lot of ad hoc requests. This is this is that team, um, and uh, this is uh, the Department of Agriculture Computer Room in 1969. Some very cool looking computers there. Um, so I am at this job, and I prove myself technically, and I start delivering projects. I join the on-call rotation. I acquire all this useful knowledge. And this knowledge brought obligation to help. And so this is what my life became. If I can click, let me try to click. Okay, yes, this is the, um, the White House uh, Conference on Library and Information Science in 1979. I imagine myself as the person at the computer there and everyone else around me is asking me questions about like why this thing is broken. And that was pretty much my life. And what happened to me is I got prioritization fatigue. So. Um, you know, I'm supposed to spend my month looking into migrating from one Kubernetes uh, provider to another strategy of hosting Kubernetes, whatever. And then all of a sudden I get pinged about the WAF and I'm like, shoot, didn't know we had a WAF, but I guess that's what I'm doing today. Um, sounds like other people have had that experience. Okay. <laughs> um, this fatigue had a lot of side effects. Uh, it kept me from focusing on technical work. And it also made me feel like I had this mountain of work that I would never get done. Um, and that, of course, was manifestly true. Like that, I had the feeling because I had this work I was supposed to do. And then there was this other work that was unplanned. So um, this resulted in the loss of time for the mythical deep work, which I believe exists somewhere. Um, so everyone on the team, I think, and you know, as I mentioned, this is sort of a mishmash of a bunch of different places that I've worked. But everyone on the team had this to some degree, where it's like you're getting interrupted a lot during the day. So you end up working later at night because um, that's the only time when you can focus on like learning 
uh, how, you know, this particular Kubernetes provider thinks about, you know, nodes or whatever it may be. So um, I think uh, in my experience, I'm going from product team to DevOps to product to DevOps to infrastructure, whatever. Um, this is harder on DevOps, SRE, and infrastructure teams than um, on product team. Product teams also have people that work late, but they're like grinding toward the deadline. And in my experience, the DevOps team, you're just like under this crushing amount of like ongoing, like, hey, this thing is broken. So there are also other problems. Uh, Apart from prioritization fatigue, this is like a spooky emoji. So that's the problem there. Um, so this team's remit was extremely large. So it was hard to know what was going on. There was a very high lottery or bus factor. This is the concept that someone on your team with a lot of like very important knowledge uh, might uh, win the lottery or get hit by a bus, uh, depending on how much you like or hate that person. Um, so uh, I was really, really worried about that on this team. and. I had this really positive experience with Scrum in my past, and I was like, "Hey, let's do Scrum. This is, you know, this is a good, this is a good plan." Um, I had the energy to change things. I did not have a toddler at that time, um, and most of all, I thought that the team commitment aspect of this would really make us share knowledge. So uh, I learned that I was wrong um, in a variety of ways, which I will now explain. So. The team assents to this new work planning regime, right? They're like, all right, sure. Very similar to the last time I did it. They were like, yeah, I don't know. Sure, wh whatever. Like, I'll just keep doing my thing. Um, but we're going to do user stories. So there we are at our first story writing session. And people were trying to make tickets like import 128 databases to Terraform config and state. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Folks, I've done Scrum before. That's not right. Uh, you need to specify the user and the business value. Right? Who's the user? And they say, oh, an ops person. And I say, what's the value? And they're like, well, I don't want to spend time in the console. And I'm like, OK. So you end up with a story like this, which is, as an ops person, I want to manage 128 databases in Terraform so that I don't have to waste time in the console, which is really bad. This is not helpful for anyone. Um, so this is like maybe an okay user story. I don't know, it's been a while since I saw one of those, but as a shopper, I can add a payment method so that I can purchase an item. Like that, you're kind of like, okay, that, that makes sense, cool. So we weren't doing that. Uh, we found that we were often the, the users in our own user stories, and this ended up being a waste of mental energy. Um, so this is the commissioner of markets. Oh, sorry, the font on the thing is a little small, and I'm pretty short sighted. So um, this is the commissioner of markets, uh, Albert Pachetta, using a sledgehammer to smash some scales that were confiscated by department inspectors, presumably because they were overcharging people for fish and meat and grain and whatnot. Uh, so I guess you can just imagine that as like smashing your team's productivity or something. I don't know. Um, so what we learned was not to waste time expressing the business value of infrastructure work to yourself as a team. And the reason you can do this is because your infrastructure team actually enables other teams to deliver business value. So if people are using the infrastructure that your team maintains, then like ipso facto, your work is valuable. So you know you can rest easy, um, assuming that like various VPs also believe that this is true. So um, thinking that user stories are awkward does not get you out of making tickets, which I know many of you are excited about not making tickets, but I found that tracking work is extremely important. Um, specifically in infrastructure, having a paper trail of not only like, hey, you changed this number from four to 400, um, but like, why did you scale up your cluster from four to 400 nodes is really, really important. Um, OK, right, so I'm telling a story, and uh, we're doing our backlog grooming. We gritted our teeth through it, and the next step was estimation. Um, this is an estimation meeting. Uh, not really. This is a county meeting in Vermont. Also looks pretty peaceful. There's no, no phones or anything. Um, very nice. Um, so I was really excited about this meeting. I thought it was going to help us break down our silos. It was going to help us from overcommitting. Uh, it was going to prevent overwork. Like you're working on an eight pointer, um, so no one's going to bother you, right? Because you're focused on this thing. So we're doing planning poker, and the first story comes, and it's a real humdinger. Uh, as a hosted application, I want to run Postfix in Kubernetes so that I don't have to think about sending email. Um, so one, two, three, and someone shouts one, and someone shouts 13. 
And I'm like, oh, very interesting. I'm, I'm, I still at this point, I think this is going well. And I think this is like a good, <laughs> a good disagreement to have. Um, and I'm like, oh, what's the deal with that? Let's explore this as a team. And, you know, the 13, of course, is like, I have never written anything related to Kubernetes. And I don't know what Postfix is. And the one is like, I have this running in US West 2. And I just have to flip the switch and it's everywhere. So uh, ultimately, we found that estimating infrastructure work was a lot harder than estimating developer tasks. Um, and uh, we found that there were a few different classes of work in infrastructure when we were trying to write user stories. The first was work that you can do like almost immediately if you have docs or a runbook. So an example of this would be like um, the one that I've been using is adding nodes to a Kubernetes cluster. And then you have this sort of work that requires like unbounded context gathering, and you don't exactly know where it's going to stop. Um, this is a bit of a facile example, but you know, adding service mesh to adding a service mesh to your clusters um, is an example of this type of work, and it requires you to comprehend a pretty complex abstraction, which you probably didn't author yourself, but someone else did, and then you need to figure out like what is the abstraction, uh, how is it controlled by these YAML files, and like what am I doing wrong. And uh, amount of, if you do enough context gathering, uh, this type of work uh, turns into uh, the first type of work, right? Uh, so once you know how Istio works or whatever, then you, you know that you just have to flip this flag and then it, it works. Um, and then you have your more traditional software development tasks, adding a command to a CLI. You know, As a user, I want to scale up the number of uh, replicas on my service so that I don't fall over in project. So in Scrum, of course, you're supposed to gather all of this context in advance of doing the work so that you can make an appropriate estimate. However, uh, I my contention here, this is like maybe the point of the talk, I don't know. Uh, the context gathering in ops is the work. It is not something that you do before the work. It is not something that is like part of the work. It like is the work. Oh, wow, you like that. All right, cool. Um, all right, that's the point of the talk, good. Um, so. I found that um, my foolish attempt to add process around context gathering, um, that just gets in the way of doing the context gathering. Um, and once you have the appropriate context, you're kind of done. So in some ops teams do an indeterminate amount of context gathering, and that is the job. So speaking of indeterminate amounts of context gathering, how did the first sprint go? Um, this is someone in a financial firm in New York City. Uh, these are some sweet machines. Um, I, I think it's early 80s, late 70s. Um, so our first sprint comes, our revolutionary work organization system has arrived. And by noon on Monday, remember in my fake example, like we're doing our sprint planning on Monday, by noon on Monday, like a third of the tickets are done. And I'm like, all right, Sam, like, good job. Like you really figured you cracked the code on this one. Get ready to buy a boat. You're getting promoted. Um, not so much, uh, more problems. I you probably remember this slide. Uh, so by Tuesday, people were starting to idle because they didn't have tickets that they could do, uh, which was not so good. So I'm like, uh, anyone want to pick up some of these tickets in this column over here? And you know, my colleague would say, no, that they, remember, uh, that's going to take me a month and a half. I don't know what post fix is. And I say, all right, that seems reasonable. We'll talk about that in retro. Um, so ultimately, I found that team members would lack the context to do all of the backlog items. Um, and so they would say, hey, like I can't do any of this other stuff. Can I bring this other ticket into the sprint? And I mean, like I'm not like the boss. I'm just like an engineer on the team, right? I'm like, uh, what about like these other tickets? You want to do one of these? And they're like, no, that's going to take me a month and a half, remember? Um, so uh, yeah, people ended up bringing more tickets into the sprint. And by the end of the first week, there was a lot of work in the in progress column, um, if you're familiar with that one. And it was seemingly abandoned, but it's like, oh, we're waiting on our GCP rep to like increase our quota so that we can scale up the cluster. Um, you know, that that one pointer that's like, you know, we're going to uh, we're going to scale up the number of nodes in the cluster. It turns out it's a little bit more complicated. So, um, yeah, the real problem, though, um, those previous problems that I was mentioning, these are all recognizable to people that have implemented Scrum, like, oh, lack of shared context. Yeah, that's why you're doing Scrum, buddy. Um, like you you didn't estimate properly. Yeah, that'll sort itself out over time. But the real problem was that the, the work started, uh, it just kept flowing in. 
So we had our team Slack channel, we had DMs, we had the CTO asking us to do stuff, we had the directors asking us to do stuff. Sometimes we had tickets, sometimes we didn't have tickets. And implementing Scrum, um, partially because we didn't successfully close the gate to new work at the beginning of the sprint, um, it didn't really solve this problem. So, you know, you're at stand up and someone's like, oh, yeah, yesterday um, I was working on purchasing reserved instances uh, for the next year. And you're like, well, we didn't have a ticket for that. And uh, they're like, yeah, well, the CTO DM'd me and was like, oh, yeah, we need to buy our eyes like tomorrow. Um, it's like, OK, well, that's good. It's good that you're doing that. That's like really excellent. I'm glad that we're buying our RIs so that we can like, you know, pay the bills and stuff um, or pay smaller bills so that we can pay other bills. Anyway, um, but this also means that Scrum failed, which is like not so great and not so good for me. Right. Like uh, this was my idea. Um, so as you might imagine, we did not finish everything that we set out to in the sprint. And the demos, uh, I don't know if you've ever done demos for infrastructure user stories. I don't recommend it. Uh, they're pretty sad if you're adding like a CLI command. It's like, okay, cool. Like, all right, I see what you did. You changed, but like you're inspecting Terraform state. You're like, yep, 126, 127, 128. Yep, okay. <laughs> Thank you for showing me. Uh, or you're clicking around like the cloud provider console. It's a total farce. Um, so, you know, that work. In addition to the demos that we did, we had all this unplanned work, which of course didn't have acceptance criteria, the horror, the acceptance criteria, I should say, the horror. Um, and we had all this work that we didn't plan on doing. So that work ended up there because unplanned work, it turns out, is inevitable. Um, ops teams, in my experience, are often on the critical path. And if someone is like, hey, can you like, can you open up the security group so that I can like, like do my job? Are you just going to be like, no, like that's not in like that's that we didn't you didn't you didn't think of that like three weeks ago to get it in our backlog? No, like you're going to you're going to open up the security group after after talking to the security team, et cetera. Um, so uh, I also find that ops folks have this like like even more than software engineers or maybe they just have a higher tolerance for boring problems, but they have like this insatiable desire to like understand weird corner cases in the infrastructure and resolve them. Um, and uh, if you're familiar with uh, XKCD, XKCD about getting nerd sniped, um, this is like very easy to do with ops people, but it's like really boring stuff. Just being like, yeah, like I wonder where that networking config lives. Like it's just not, not, not that interesting. But for some reason, we love it. Um, so what do you do with all this unplanned work? Uh, well, having messed this up several times, um, I think embrace the unplanned work and track it. So nominally, I'm telling a story here. Um, what happens to our team that tried to do Scrum? Well, uh, we got a little bit better at it. Um, we dropped our rigid user story requirements because those were absurd. And we dedicated a person to field urgent requests because like, that's part of what our team does. And we improved, but still there was all this work in progress. There was lots of work completed immediately after the start of the sprint. And then there was this inability to share the, share the commitment of the sprint due to the lack of context. Um, and we settled into some Scrum anti-patterns. If any of you have, you know, uh, met, some of this might be familiar to you, I should say. Um, people made sure that they had their tickets in the sprint before it began. Uh, we underloaded our sprints to make room for ad hoc work. Um, and the Scrum process eventually faded into the background. Like some, some, sometimes we would just like forget to have sprint planning and nobody cared. Uh, even me, even me. So um, what did I learn? Uh, don't waste time expressing business value for infrastructure work to yourself as a team. This is, you, you're already getting paid, you know, uh, you just do your job. And the context gathering is often the work. Unplanned work is of course inevitable. And you can't solve organizational problems on the team level. There wasn't a whole section about this, but I think you kind of get the idea here. If your CTO is DMing you about purchasing reserved instances the day before that uh, your old ones expire, like you probably have bigger fish to fry than like agile versus, yeah. Um, so um, I have 11 minutes left that I would hopefully can use to end on a brighter note. Uh, offering some thoughts towards a better planning system. So uh, this is a made up chart. Uh, it is a hopefully useful generalization about unplanned work on infrastructure teams. 
The y-axis is the, the y-axis is the percentage of work that's inevitably unplanned, and the x-axis is the name of your team. So this is clearly a generalization, but if anyone is like a Hacker News commenter in the audience, this is you know this is I'm I'm caveating my my talk pretty significantly here. Um, so you know if you're on an ops or a DevOps team, uh, you probably are getting interrupted a lot with like ad hoc requests. Maybe if you're on like a platform team. Uh, you're getting interrupted a little bit less because you've productized some of your offerings. And then if you're on like the caching platform team, like, oh baby, like you spend your days just writing a sweet CLI to provision Redis instances and like network them appropriately. What a life that is. Um, so if you are on the far left side of this, um, far left side of this, uh, this cool chart that I made uh, in Google Sheets, um, here are, uh, oh, this is the computer traffic control room. I think it's DC based on the map. They also have like a traffic light in there as decor. I think that's pretty cool. Um, so if you're on that far left side of the graph, I would offer this set of principles for how you might want to plan your work. Uh, your work planning system should make your team more effective. Yes. Um, and you should prioritize urgent ad hoc requests to go back to that Eisenhower matrix. Um, and you should track all of your work in flight, no matter how small. Um, I mean, maybe there's, maybe there's a, a minimum, but yeah. And finally, you should be able to rank work's importance so that you don't waste your time on stuff that you don't need to do. So uh, if you are familiar with Kanban, uh, if I had finished that book, Kanban kind of fits the bill for this. Um, in Kanban, I'm, I'm no expert. I've spent a lot more time in Scrum environments than Kanban environments, but often Scrum environments kind of deteriorate into like a bad version of Kanban, and that's probably where, where I spent most of my time. Uh, so in Kanban, everything has a ticket, and your ticket is allowed to be short and messy, and you move tickets on your board from left to right, which is like pretty normal. Um, and you try to limit the amount of work in progress. And you know you calibrate that based on your team, depending on like how responsive your GCP rep is or whatever. Um, maybe you need to have a lot of slots for um, waiting for query, uh, quota increases. And then you also want to continuously improve your process. And the way that you know that you're improving is that it takes less time for tickets to move from to do to done. So if, it, if your average ticket takes seven days to get from to do to done, uh, you want to get it to six, and then you want to get it to five, and you just want to constantly improve that process. So on an ops team, this might look something like this. Uh, you've got your unprioritized column where you just throw all your crap, you know, uh, no bar to get in there. Just like you got an idea, you're like, hey, we should use Pulumi. Like, sure, throw it in there. Uh, and then you've got your to-do column, and in to-do, you would ideally have your important stuff at the top and your less important stuff at the bottom, and that's that. Uh, take people on your team. Uh, pull stuff from the top of the to-do column and they put it in in progress. Very cool. Um, and then when you're done, you put it in done. And I propose a stale column because there's always this crap, right? That 128 databases getting imported into Terraform state, that would probably be in the stale column, to be honest. Like that's probably, you don't have time for that. And so what about all that unplanned work? Um, so this, this is the teletype room at the municipal airport in Washington, DC. Actually, uh, I was driving up I-35 in Minnesota uh, a few weeks ago, and there was an honest-to-goodness TTY payphone at a rest stop, which was very cool. Highly recommend if you're on the way between Minneapolis and Duluth, stop at all the rest stops until you see a TTY. Um, so uh, you want to dedicate team members to both evaluate the urgency of ad hoc requests and then also execute them if necessary. And I think also make it very clear that anyone on the team can do unprioritized tasks immediately. Uh, a lot of Scrum is concerned with like making sure you don't like do unnecessary work. But the folks on the ops teams, uh, generally they like, they know what needs to be done. They're like, yeah, I got, I got to do this database backup like today or, or like I need to like renew the better example. I need to renew this cert today or like we're, and so you can just, just do it, just let your team work. Like don't, don't have all these barriers. And uh, I would also propose that you do a short daily prioritization session of that to-do column. And um, my bias is towards doing this collaboratively. Maybe you have a daily stand-up for like literally five minutes where you look at this column and you're like, all right, does this still look right to people? Or is, you know, um, 
And you could also have a senior team member or, um, you know, uh, the manager or a product owner responsible for doing this. But, you know, that's, that's kind of it. So I have two more slides left, but I'm pretty much done with the talk. Uh, this one is, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. Thanks to um, everyone at Datadog. And the next slides, um, uh, Shopify, where I work, is hiring. Uh, Linkpop.com, Shopify Production Engineering. That's the prod engine department. Um, you do not have to work with me. There's a lot of teams that are uh, not currently being just like completely ransacked of all their productivity through this like planning changes stuff. And that's it. Thank you. I guess there's time for questions. So if you have questions, we'll do them. Thank you, Sam. We have mics in the aisles. So if you have a question, come on up. Yeah. Uh, let me make sure are you, you're asking if, if there's been any success, if I've had any success with planning context gathering. Well, uh, like, please case be all right. Yeah. And then, you know, just kind of things like that. Okay, well, let's draw from experience and try to break it down as much yes. as possible that we can, as much as we can before, you know, breaking down these known unknowns versus, you know, being, I guess the question would be being a known professional. Yeah. Oh God. Um, like I said, pain. Yeah. Uh, time boxing. Uh, <laughs> time boxing is helpful because then you at least you sort of are like, hey, let's like spend a week looking into this, and then you know one person spend a week looking into this, and you can throughout the course of that week you'll sort of understand. Maybe you'll understand the size of the problem, and then you're like, oh, we need a month to look into this properly. Or maybe you're already done. Um, but I think the other crucial piece of that is like, you got to start out with enough bandwidth to do the context gathering. I feel like that's the real problem in places where I've worked, where it's like, yeah, we want to spend like a month evaluating a migration to Nomad from Kubernetes. And it's like, well, we don't, we don't have the people. Um, and and you're, there's no planning process that will like get you out of being like under, under provisioned as a team. But yeah, I would say, Try to make time boxed tickets and go from there. And then if you if you've got the the, um, the appetite, you know, break that down. Uh, so yeah. Anyway, looks like there's other questions. So I'll stop rambling. <laughs> Not so much a question, but everything you said is exactly why my, the infantry my bond switched from scrum bond to full time bond. So yeah. <laughs> thank you for validating every decision. We oh made. yeah. You got it. I've heard, I've heard that a lot. And people are like, yeah, that, that talk didn't really have a focus, but it felt true. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Oh yeah, no. This I think this is a capacity thing as well. Where uh, there has to, so there has to be you. This presupposes a willingness on the. So you've got the, the person with the knowledge and the person without the knowledge. This presupposes that the person with the knowledge uh, has the like wants to share the knowledge, which probably they do. And then the person without the knowledge uh, wants to learn. And then also that there's enough time for people to work on a task together, because that's kind of the solution there. The person with the knowledge either needs to write a really good piece of software or a runbook that's really good or pair with someone to spread the knowledge. And there's there's not really shortcuts around that, in my experience anyway. Yeah. Oh, yes. Um, so so when your team has this experience that for uh, for some random reason you didn't do sprint planning. Yeah. And then it turns out <laughs> to be your best sprint ever. <laughs> like, what do you do with that feeling? Um, yeah. Let's see. Um, switch to Kanban. I mean, <laughs> is that something that happens uh, on your, your squad? Yeah, I mean, literally, our manager and tech lead are out for baby and wedding. Yeah, we yeah. literally don't sprint. Now, to our manager's credit, he actually gives very well-organized projects and how it's all kind of synergized. Yeah. But we just kind of hit that point where it's like, wow, we're productive and not worrying about sprint planning. Hmm. So it's sort of like the team is doing deep work and not worrying about sprint planning as opposed hmm. to individuals doing deep work. But that happened like one time out of like a year. Oh my and it gosh. feels like our processes should like be about having that energy more often. 
Yeah, that sounds great. Just like everything works all of a sudden for no reason in particular, except that you're manager it out. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Have you considered getting a new manager? I don't <laughs> no, I, I, I don't know, but I would like to hear more. Uh, so come find me, please. Um, yeah, we can. Yeah. Yeah. Oh boy. Yeah. Um, how many people work at your company? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you find you, 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 you've got your, you've got your idea. You're like, this is the problem. Uh, I would say you, you find your strategic partners in every separate silo of your 30 person, whatever. And then you try to understand if they believe the same thing that you believe um, that like, Hey, we've got this problem X, Y, Z. Um, and then ideally um, you work at a place where if you have consensus among a bunch of people that have a reasonable amount of like experience, uh, you, uh, and it depends on where you work, you write a doc, you give it to the CTO, or you write a doc, you give it to the CPO, and you're like, this is what we think, uh, this is uh, what we're this is what we're feeling, uh, we think we would be more effective if X, Y, Z. But anyway, I'm a nerd, so like you can, <laughs> that's like a very much like go to the library and look and do your research kind of example, but I would say, yeah, find your allies in the org and go from there. Yeah. Hi, I'm a tech lead for a small team, but with a huge scope. Oh boy, sorry. <laughs> as most of us are. Yeah. Um, many of the people on my team say that they don't like uh, kind of having to make these tickets for these big projects that we have to do, and they would just rather have a ticket that's like deliver MVP of this yeah. big project. So yeah. I can just focus on that. What are your thoughts on that? Um, how many people are on your team? Three. <laughs> Three. And how long do the, how long, if there's a project that's like deliver an MVP, how long does it take? Uh, probably about, Three, four weeks, but we're doing two week sprints. Ooh, yeah. And do people share projects or they're working on them solo? <laughs> well, we're trying we try to do one project per person just to maximize the like, yeah. Output. I mean, I feel like if if you're doing one project per person and you can crank out an MVP in three or four weeks and you don't need to um you don't need to be sharing work. A lot of the point of tickets is to be like sharing, like breaking down stuff into like like parallelizable work so that you can like you know have like a maximum maximally effective team like if you don't if that's not part of what your team is supposed to be doing because you're all working on separate things then i don't know i feel like use all of your energy that you would spend on like chopping something up into tickets into like documenting the hell out of what you've done and making it really like usable and like have really good run books um, but then as soon as you, as soon as you hit like four or five people, or you have juniors on the team and you're trying to like have the, the, the leads that are running these projects actually share their knowledge, like then they got to write, they got to write tickets. Sorry. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> That's my take. Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh Oh. Uh, me personally, no, um, I do not care about velocity, um, because I would say I've worked on so many like interrupt heavy teams. It's just kind of like, we just want to make sure that we're tracking everything that we do so that we can make the case that like our backlog is growing more quickly than we can execute it. And even though we're improving our lead time, we still need more people to execute all of this work. Um, I think once you're at a place where you can actually right, remember my fake graph that was like, if you're the caching platform team, like for sure, like you probably want to do scrum and have like velocities, um, or at least you want to be doing two week sprints and have approximately the amount, the right amount of work in those things. Um, but I think it's pretty dependent on the team. So that's like a non answer, but that's the best I can do. Yeah. 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 This is our last question. All right. That's you. Uh, hey. That was great. Everything really rang through. Oh, um, cool. And especially for a lot of ad hoc work that you talked about. But I kind of I can't help but wondering if there's still situations that happen where you know, hey, we decide we're going to re-architect this whole thing. Yeah. In those kinds of projects.
project. Yeah. It's done side by side, just kind of like we all that other stuff. Mm -hmm. Does yeah, I think there is value in breaking it down to some point and moving past before you can even sing. Yeah. And if you're already on Kanban, it makes sense. Yeah. Um, okay. So this is like maybe a little bit theoretical-ish kind of answer, but like, okay, so say you're doing Kanban and it's going good and your team is like 40% interrupt driven um, and you have a manager on your team and you have a tech lead and three other people and your manager is like, hey, tech lead, we're going to like migrate to Nomad. Um, let's do it. Or probably more accurately, the tech lead is like, hey, manager, we're, <laughs> we're going to migrate to Nomad. And uh, I would say the tech lead then, or you know, anyway, the tech lead is like, is they're responsible for chopping this thing up into tickets. And remember like Kanban, you're supposed to have stuff that you're supposed to reduce that like lead time from, from to do to done. So they've got a stack of, of 15 tickets and they should be executable in approximately the same, like the same ballpark of duration, you know, zero to four days that all the rest of the Kanban tickets uh, are. And then you just put those tickets at the top of the queue and you pull them off. Uh, and then it'll be very visible if ad hoc work is beating out that because um, they're, they're in the same they're in the same stack. Right. And so your manager is going to have to say whoever's managing that product backlog is going to have to say, like, nope, actually you gotta do, you gotta purchase the RIs. You can't work on, you can't work on the Nomad uh, migration or whatever. So even without story points, I think Kanban pushes you towards, like if you have, if you're doing Kanban and you have something in to do for like a month, like you're not, you're not doing Kanban. You're just, <laughs> you just have a ticket. Um, so I don't know, is that helpful at all? Yeah, sure, yeah. <laughs> I'm happy to talk more. <laughs>